Patrick Line is a Montreal Canadian as the Oilers decline to match the offer sheets from St. Louis. Hey, everyone. Welcome into Off the Post. Rob Long joined alongside by Canucks reporter for the Vancouver Sun and the province, Patrick Johnston and Post Media Hockey columnist Bruce Garriock. And guys, turns out NHL GMs do not care that we're all trying to enjoy our summer. They've got business to take care of. And in Montreal, Bruce, the Habs made a pretty big deal acquiring Patrick Line and a second round pick from Columbus for defenseman Jordan Harris. You've seen quite a bit of this Habs team in recent years. Is this a worthwhile gamble for a team trying to take that next step? I, I absolutely 100% think it is. I mean, you know, I, I heard a stat somewhere that Patrick Line in the last few years ranks fifth in goals scored with a slap shot. Hmm. Um, and one of the guys he's behind is Sam Coast. One of the other guys he's behind is Alex Ovechkin. That says a lot to me, Patrick, about the way that Patrick Line can contribute to the Montreal Canadiens. I kind of see a situation where Saku Koivu went to Montreal and, and he had a lot of lot of success while he was there. And I kind of feel like in some way, shape, or form, Patrick Line, who we know has struggled with mental health, can go in there, feel comfortable in a in a in a Canadian situation. He played in Winnipeg, he understands the pressures of playing in a Canadian market. And he, I think he also understands the pressures of playing in Montreal. You know, a lot of people talk about what Patrick Line uh, ha- can't do. What, let's talk about what he can do. He can score goals. And if he can get back to being a 40 to 50 goal scorer in the National Hockey League, he's going to be a very dangerous acquisition. And also getting the second round pick to pick up his whole salary, I thought that was a brilliant move, Patrick. He scored at a great rate and even through all his struggles. And here's the thing. If he doesn't take the Habs to where they want to get to, but is still scoring goals, he could be a very useful trade chip at the deadline, right? The Habs could get the, I don't, there's almost no way for the Habs to lose. I mean, obviously if he stops scoring and he just becomes an albatross, that's a nightmare, but the player can still, like you said, there's still things he can do. It's a fresh start. Obviously lots of pressure there, but He hasn't played in a big market. You know, he's played in a Canadian market in Winnipeg, obviously a bit of a fishbowl, but he played in Columbus. Nobody's paying attention to him. Uh, It's going to be an interesting dynamic for him, for sure, going to a huge Canadian market where the passion is, you know, relentless. But if he scores goals, he's going to be a hero. Yeah, he absolutely will be. Makes it a a pretty deadly one-two combo there on the power play with Cole Caulfield. Meanwhile, the uh, Edmonton Oilers decided not to match the offer sheets on Philip Broberg and Dylan Holloway, who are now St. Louis Blues, Patrick. Uh, We also saw the the Oilers make a bit of a side deal with St. Louis to get back a prospect in a third-round pick. So maybe this was a little bit of, you know, give us some more or we'll match kind of deal. But were you surprised that Edmonton chose the cap space over the young players? Once they made the deal, obviously, with the Canucks to pick up the Silly put Coles in and and uh, and with San Jose to pick up Ty Emerson. I started going, okay, I think I see what's happening here. They found their replacements. Listen, I was never that high on Philip Roberg. I think of the two signings, that could be the one that blows up on Edmonton's face. Dylan Holloway had a great playoffs, really interesting player. Uh, I, I imagine the Oilers, that was the harder one to move on from. Obviously, Broberg picked in the first round is a difficult thing to pass on. The potential is still there. But a player that had struggled to impose himself in the AHL, let alone in the NHL, obviously did play a role in the playoffs. But on that team, they had to make some decisions. And and in the end, this is what the salary cap is about and the offer sheets are about. I'm I'm glad to see that Doug Armstrong went for it. He forced some decisions. The Oilers had to make some decisions. It created uh, opportunities for a couple players who maybe weren't going to be playing in the NHL this season. And now they're in the NHL. And I am not surprised in the end the Oilers moved that they were going to have to do something. And it keeps them some cap space. And obviously the dry settle question remains. And we'll see what happens with Evander Kane. You know, I look, I, they've met with dry settles camp. Jeff Jackson and Stan Bowman sat down with dry settles camp last month in Toronto. And I, I think there's a, uh, I don't know, pathway to, to making a long-term deal. I think that dry settle wants to stay. Obviously the Oilers want to keep him. So I think that, you know, uh, at some point or another, we're going to hear that Leon Dreisaitl has, has signed a long-term deal. I just think that's where it's headed. Uh, you know, anything can change, obviously. As far as this deal goes, so I think where where the St. Louis Blues played this perfectly was they handcuffed the Oilers in year two because Evan Bouchard is going to be on a new deal. And at that point, Leon Dreisaitl is going to be on a new deal. 
And if you've got Roberg and Holloway at the numbers that the St. Louis Blues gave them offer sheets on, second year, they're going to be in a tough position to be competitive. And, and, and I think that's where this was a brilliant piece of work by Doug Armstrong. Do I think it was a bit of a payback for the Oilers firing his buddy, um, uh, Ken Holland? Yeah, I do. But I also, and I made this point last week, I also think that Ottawa could have been in this position with Shane Pinto. And came to the re- Steve Stales came to the realization fairly quickly, he didn't want to get his hands tied here and paid to get Matthew Joseph off the books. Look, we all know, and, and we haven't got enough room on the screen to fit in Jeff Jackson's ego. But it, <laughs> you know what? It's tough to be the smartest guy in the room and then look, like you're not very smart in the end because you lost two pretty good players. You want to hear incredible conspiracy theory? And this is just me spitballing. I have no basis to believe this, but similar to what, uh, what Bruce is talking about, you know, Philip Roberg doesn't play those two games at the end of the season, not eligible for an offer sheet. So it could have been that Kenny Holland saw the writing on the wall and thought, you know, I'll make this guy open to it. I'll be out of here. It'll be their problem. Not mine. I, I listen, that's oh wild. Gosh, that, that's really. Could you good. imagine? Could Yo, you that's, imagine? That's really good stuff, right there. <laughs> but but at the end of the day, listen, it's a bet by Doug Armstrong that these two guys are going to be more than just the depth players they would have been for the Oilers. And and this is what the cap is about. The cap forces you to make choices on on your guys. If you're going to pay your stars, you're going to have to make choices on other parts of the, of the roster, no matter how much of a discount they take. And the 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 Blues have benefited from this. Well, you've got one team in St. Louis that's uh, getting younger and one team in Edmonton that's uh, already the oldest team in the league. Only two players on their roster under the age of 30. So they are uh, all in at this point. As always, leave your thoughts in the comments section below. For Patrick Johnston and Bruce Garriock, I'm Rob Wong. Thanks for watching and we'll talk to you next time.